computer. Here we go. OK, well, thank you again for joining us. I can see people coming in uh, to the webinar. And if you want to drop us a note in the chat, you can be able to see that chat box at the bottom. You can tell us where you're from. Um, and I am going to kick off by introducing you to our fantastic speaker today. Nicola Graham is the Managing Director of Simplify Change here in the UK, although she works internationally. And she has an extensive background in consulting within top firms and government bodies around the world. She's the author of this, Build, Excite, Equip, How to Simplify Change Adoption in Your Projects. And she enjoys cycling and volunteering with ocean conservation charities. So that was a really interesting little fact. Did you want to tell us a bit about your um, conservation work? Yeah, by all means. Um, I've basically been an avid um, diver now for six or well, seven years um, and I I'm found myself volunteering on a ocean cleanup um, in the Maldives actually about five years ago and um, I learned a lot about marine biology and um, obviously the the impact that that many things have in on the seas one of them obviously be, being global warming um, so I started um, with that and then since then have just been focused heavily on where I can improve things so Going, going and uh, doing lionfish spearing because sadly they're, they're, they're in places they shouldn't be and a lot of uh, beach cleanups and things like that and it is my future to retire somewhere and Brilliant. growth grow, growing of the uh, corals and things like that so yeah how fascinating so, yeah. Yeah. A couple of people have messaged me. I was saying put things in the chat and unfortunately chat was disabled, but that is now enabled. So I can see Deborah's posted where she's from in the States and so is Barbara. So I'm um, sorry about not having that on from the beginning, but uh, chat is now open. I know Nicola will take questions at the end, but if you want to drop questions into the chat, I will try and pick those up. We've also got the, the Q&A option as well that um, you could, if it's a specific question, you could put it in there. But otherwise, we can. I'll try and monitor the chat as we go through because I know that Nicola will be busy presenting her screen and sharing things. So I will turn off my camera and hand the reins over to you, Nicola. It's yep, perfect. Okay, yep. and I'm going to share my screen. Oh, actually, it's saying I can't share my screen. Oh, it seems to have blocked all the security options for everything. Oops, now I'm sharing my screen. That is not what I wanted to do. Okay. the presentation if that's easier uh let me you can always do that yes it's always the case sometimes the uh the settings change don't they and you end up um oh actually it says i'm a host now let me try one more time try that now yes thank you brilliant okay right so um can i just check that you're seeing a presentation right now we're seeing powerpoint right now and now we can see the presentation Fantastic. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> it's getting, we're getting there. So um, hi, everyone, and uh, good morning to some of you. Obviously, it's evening here in the UK, um, and obviously, it's a, a pleasure to, to have you uh, on the webinar today. So thank you for attending. Um, just before we do begin, um, I just wanted to go through a few um, welcome notes. So obviously, we are on Zoom today. Um, and just a little thing about the accessibility. So if you would like to put your captions on, um, you should be able to do that. Um, obviously, that helps with um, being able to um, have a transcribe of what I'm saying. I often find that it, that's easier for me personally. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or um, put a um, question in the chat. And obviously, Elizabeth's already said that she would um, kindly jump in if there are questions. Questions are really welcomed, so do do you know? Do feel free to um, ask questions during or at the end. And then finally, if you don't mind, um, if everyone is on mute, um, unless you do have a question, just because it's less distracting. So. Um, Obviously, my name is Nicola Graham. Um, Elizabeth's given me a fabulous introduction already, so I won't need to go through this um, in, in too much detail. But last year, I was able to release my first book, Build, Excite, Equip. Um, so I'm officially a, a, an author of that now. Um, I don't know why this is popping over so quickly, sorry. Uh, and I, I've uh, had, a, had a long background now in both uh, project change management but also business change management I did move into into the world of business change um, after spending several years in projects 
A little bit about um, my company. I do um, own a consultancy firm specializing in business change management. So um, I very much focus the company on people. Um, so it's very much around solving those problems effectively um, and uh, guaranteeing adoption. So I tend to focus the, the company in three different ways. The interactive side, that's a lot of the things we produce, um, Google games, etc. Focusing on the adoption, which is the B methodology mainly, and our consulting. So um, before I go on, I do have a, I do have a quick question uh, for everyone. Um, a poll, if you will, but what do you think is the main element towards a project being successful? So maybe we could just pop a few, few answers in the chat. What do you think it might be? Okay, so Nikki, we've got Nikki saying people, Kristen Byan, comms, comms, lots of comms engagements, communications, comms, comms, comms. Okay, so um, requirements. Fabulous. Thank you. Um, all, all very valid. But the um, main element towards projects being successful is actually people. So there's been some statistics that stated 70% of projects will fail as a result of missing the vital element, which is engaging the people. So those who are put in awareness, communication, it's all very much the same thing. And that's what we're going to go through in today's um, session. All in all, if an organization has an effective change in communication program, they are 3.5 times more likely to out outperform their peers. And a little bit of a spoiler alert in today's um, presentation, this is something that everyone is able to do. It, it's, it's, it's a very important element, but it's something that actually any good project can succeed in. So true to word, I'm here to bring that awareness to everyone, if you don't have it already. So what is a project team's focus? now? Um, my previous times of working in a project or as a project manager, I would focus on those three main elements, the time, the quality and cost. But actually taking people on the journey wasn't something or isn't something that's, that, that, that's often considered as part of a project. That's also known as things like adoption, business change, management and transformation. And if we were to look at that in a five staged um, life cycle, if I was to interview many people and say, okay, so what kind of engagement do we have in a project? You look at things like meeting with senior stakeholders, doing business requirement gathering in workshops, you'll do some tactical comms, uh, what I consider to be T minus comms. So from go live, informing people about the change that's happening. Maybe involving a trainer at some point so that obviously we focus on a training plan and we give that training as and when the go live happens. Often we'll do a UAT, user acceptance testing uh, during the build to obviously make sure the product is fit for purpose. And we'll continue to send those emails. Just some statistics for you. Only 2% of people will read an email from a, pro, uh, from a project team. So I'm really sorry to drop that, to drop that information on your, on, on your desks as such, but essentially a lot of the emails that you currently send to a business won't be read by them. There's 69% um, of people will read an email that's sent from their manager. Okay, so immediately by changing the sender of an email, you're gonna have more traction or more awareness within, those, uh, within the business people. Another fact um, is when it comes to training, motivating people to attend training is a challenge and it, the, the uptake of actual training is one of the most challenges, challenging parts of a trainer's um, career. I've been in many, many situations um, and, it, and it's a, an often a um, situation that I come across where somebody will be telling me that they haven't been given any training on a system. You know, they're expected to use this new product and they haven't been given any training. And yet IT have done a Tuesday or a lunchtime or a Friday afternoon 
drop in session every single week with cakes and people people haven't actually attended it they haven't gone to that training we're we're living in um an era of digital disruption funny enough i was i was playing this uh the, this game with my teenage sons the other day about kind of what what words they reckon what words they recognize from say my youth things like tamagotchi or um cassette players and things like that it was quite a fun game between us and what i explained to them at the time was the 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 curvature that the that that generation has experienced since i was a child has been rapid compared to what mine was so when i was growing up i was still familiar with a lot of the things my parents had in tech in in as technology but it's been such a rapid growth and that's what we're experiencing in our businesses so i'm really sorry i don't know why this is it's got a timer on it clearly i haven't taken off um so what we're seeing with people in businesses is that they're being unindated by all of these different products, different changes, systems, processes, all of this rapid growth. And what, what you tend to find is you get a lot of similar go live activities going on. You'll get people expecting somebody to change. And then what happens to the business is they're constantly bombarded with all of these changes. They're expected to go on training. They're expected to read these emails. They're expected to move to new systems. And then actually what they end up doing is saying, you know what, I'm fed up. I can't do this anymore, go away. You know, I'm very frustrated. So my experience as a business change manager is I've always found myself in this situation where you've got a project over here um, shown on the left, uh, on the left hand side, on my screen anyway. Um, and then over here, you've got this business that have more and more frustrated with projects and they're pretty much screaming at them and saying you know what just leave us alone we're not interested in changing and so unfortunately you get this this gap between the business and the project teams and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger which is a real shame because actually what project people are trying to deliver are improvements to somebody's life majority of the time you know there's a return on return on investment here for them business people it's going to help them it's going to change things it's going to make them more productive um but the business don't even realize that because by this time they're so frustrated they, they're not interested so in a project, obviously, we're always focusing on success and benefits of that project. And we therefore have an expected return on investment, which is the green line here. So we come to go live, we have this expected return. And then you get this business on go live say, sorry, I don't have time for this. I'm not doing it. I don't understand it. In fact, I, I don't even want to do this. So then actually you get an actual return on investment, which is this red line here. And so what usually happens is people don't use the system. So you start spending money on a system that's not used. And more often than not means you can't switch off a previous system or you, you're introducing a new change into the company and it's not being used. Whatever that return on investment is, you actually tend to get a decrease in it after go live. So I'm... As I always explain, parachuted into failing projects and they're only failing because of this situation here. And so I'm faced with all of this resistance as a business change manager. I have people refusing anything about the product, pro product or project. You know, they don't want this difference. But it, within time, obviously, I come along with my expertise and then you begin to get them on board and you see this growth. And finally, we start to meet our return on investment. But obviously, this time has gone past um, in between the go live and the time that people start to accept the change. So let's look at the benefits to a project. What, why should we be interested in, in embracing change management as a whole, as a project team? If we were to take people on that journey, let's look at time. The more you engage and excite the people, the quicker they adopt a system. And therefore, you're more likely to keep to your project timelines. The quality of the pro product or project that you are delivering, the more you engage and involve the people, the more willing that they will be to test and also provide you feedback. And therefore, you're going to achieve a higher quality solution. 
and cost elements of engaging the people is that you're going to have a more positive experience and pe um, people will be willing to change and therefore um, and therefore you'll find a reduction in last minute additional costs who here has been in that situation where you have um, you've had to uh, throw in a load more trainers or floor walkers because people aren't aren't adopting the product as quickly as we need to you're going to reduce that cost okay so if we are if if we have effective change management in our projects we are more likely to achieve our objectives stay on our schedules and stay on budgets so how do we make a change? This is how I evolved into the B methodology. I decided that I needed to simplify the process so it was easy for anyone to follow and that a whole project team can take on this accountability. Strip out those bulky change activities that I would do as, as a full-time um, full uh, full role and make it focused on results. Guide and educate project teams so that we can start to bridge that gap between the projects and the people that are impacted by those projects. And then provide supporting tools to help support the change process. So make this easier for you. So what happened was we, or I created um, what is now known as my B methodology, BEE, -E, which stands for build, excite and equip. And the concept of the B methodology is that it overlays existing project life cycles or methodologies. So in today's session, I will walk you through each part, each, each part of the B methodology and show you where that sits within a five-stage um, five project life cycle. So focusing on um, the, the build side, build is around prepare and plan. We break that down into three main areas, organization, the people and the project. So this is creating those foundations and understanding how to manage the change as you go along your project. It's very much analysis at this point. So if we were to overlay the B methodology into a project life cycle. I mentioned before that it would be a five stage. Obviously this would vary based on, on the size of your project or program that you're working on. But the build phase sits or ten, usually sits within the initiation and design. So from an organizational perspective, this is around defining or at least understanding our business and its culture. What kind of business are we? What's our culture look like? For example, if you're dealing with a um, if you're dealing with a global organization, the culture will be very different based on who you are dealing with compared to um, a, a, a single country um, uh, culture. Understanding our resources. This point here is um, fundamental at this point uh, at this stage because you may already have people within the organization that can help you. For example, you might have a really great marketing creative media group, might, um, might have a, an internal comms team that can help you with communications. You might find that you um, have a really good um, existing uh, community uh, of people that are already engaging and um, present into the company. So this is people that you should be able to lean on within the company. And understanding that at this point is crucial because it will help define whether you need additional support, whether somebody in your project team needs to deal with that, or whether it's something that you can take on board from, from existing resources. Understanding the maturity of the organization. The chances are um, often when you're using the B methodology is you're more likely to be immature when it comes to a change element, because if you are mature, then chances are you'll already have a business change manager working on these projects for you. Next, next part of um, build in the initiation stage is engaging key stakeholders. This is something that you tend to do um, uh, um, already. You know, you're gonna have those, um, you're gonna have those engagements with the key stakeholders, but this expands out a little bit further. It helps to understand how engaged they truly are and also who's willing to that 
then become more um, more focused on getting you the results you need. Another part that we recommend you look at in build and initiation is the project itself. So a lot of this you'll know because you're um, sorry. Uh, a lot of this you'll know because you are obviously running the projects. But this is around okay. What does the project? Uh, what does the um, timelines look like? You know, do we have a communication strategy? If not, let's produce one. Do we have training training needs? Um, and what do they look like at this stage? And also, more importantly, what would a successful rollout look like for us? Now, in projects, we often focus on, okay, we have some business, we have some success criteria that we want to achieve, which will which will blend into our return on investments. But actually, what does that look like from an engagement element? That's 70% of projects that fail. Let's make sure that we're not one of those. So what do we consider to be a successful adoption or uptake of this product or project? And the other part in build that we focus on are the people. People become absolutely crucial, crucial throughout the, this entire project. But here in build, it's really um, it's really vital to understand and start to engage those people. So we tend to do that during the design phase, the design phase being the time where you can really start to uh, confirm what's happening um, and have a better understanding of when it will happen. So this is around continuing to engage those key, key stakeholders, selecting influencers and champions. We come on to more information um, in today's session, but influencers essentially are your advocates for the project. They are the people that are going to spread the word for you. They could be anyone from communication leads to senior management to, I've actually had scenarios where the secretary has been an influencer because they've been fantastic at speaking to everyone, really friendly. And then your champions. Champions, um, it, Often, often it's a, it's a well-known word, but essentially these are the people that are going to help coach and educate people within their existing teams on the, on, on the change. They're going to be that one person in each department team area, depending on obviously which organization you work for, but they're going to be that, that go-to person to help support their colleagues. And they become vital because they help you scale up. And then understanding what change players you have and what you can do to help move people along in that in, in their change player area. So here's some examples of build. Um, so I mentioned before the understanding of the key stakeholders. So are they engaged? And if not, who do we target? So by analysis, you can start to do questionnaires or reviews or interviews on people. Um, we have a tool that we use, and I um, I have a lot of uh, free material free material on my website, which gives you um, some some templates that you can also use here. But what this looks like is down below. This is an example of a group of people that we've analysed. And the greens are obviously, it's a rag status, green is good, red is bad. Um, so here we've got uh, this name, K Broomfield, Brownfield, sorry, need to get glasses clearly. And below this person here, you've got several people that are also red. What that tells me from this chart is actually this group here, this section aren't engaged. So my immediate go-to would be to focus on Kay, or even maybe Travis or Percy, because one of these persons will help advocate up and advocate down. So the, the focus here becomes, let's get these guys to, if not green, at least amber, because they're going to be more engaged and more willing to help spread the word, advocate, champion, but also use. Social network analysis is something that um, I've that I focus on heavily. It essentially gives you a really good indication of champions and influencers. Again, influencers being the advocates, champions being the supporters. And what I love about social network analysis is that it's actually um, a, a weighted set of questions that 
give you a true picture of who your influencers are and who your champions are. We can make a very hierarchical decision around this often. So if we come back to this group here, we immediately assume, assume that Martin is going to be a really good influencer. Martin being at the top here. It's not always the way. Actually, somebody anywhere in this division could be a good influencer because they are uh, communicative, because they are willing to chat, like I said, Previously, I've had a secretary, um, sorry, a receptionist who has been one of the best influencers because she was the most friendliest person that, that you could imagine. And she managed to chat and tell you everything that was going on. So this is a really good, good way of doing that. Understanding change players, keeping on that rag status, keeping it very simple. You have positive, neutral, and negative change players. In, in, in the speciality of business change, there are actually several different kinds of change players, but I like to keep it to three. Are they positive? Are they willing to, 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 to accept and embrace? Are they neutral, i.e. they could swing both ways, they could, they could become positive, or they could find themselves becoming more negative, or are they negative change players? Positive people do need focus as well. Um, positive people, I, I, I use this as a really good example. Um, you are cooking for someone, whether that be a partner, a friend, whoever. You spend a long time cooking for them and they turn up and they don't thank you for the food. They just eat the food. They don't compliment it. They don't give you any kind of gratification for doing that. Are you going to cook for them again? Probably not because they haven't they haven't supported your positive behavior. OK, so people who are positive in your projects, say people who are enthusiastic in your projects, you need to keep them, keep them there. You need to sustain that because actually they can become very negative very quickly if they're not felt like that that they are having um, uh, recognition. Neutral people need a different different approach to negative people um, and understanding that at this stage will help you to, um, uh, to, to create the right kind of training materials and engagement materials so that you can work amongst these different people. Something else um, that we often do and build is focusing on personas. So this kind of, th th this blends into how you should communicate and train them. Language will be different um, based on the role that you are doing. And when I say language, I'm not referring to the obvious languages. I'm referring to the way that people will use certain words. Um, Engineers here will speak very differently to um, somebody in uh, finance. For example, the way you communicate with financial people tends to be quite money focused. Um, they don't really want to understand the main benefits of getting them more efficient. They want to understand that it's going to save them money, for example, whereas somebody in sales will want to understand the efficiencies. Are they going to save time? Is it going to bother them too much? Uh, in, 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 you know, in their, in, in their working days. So understanding that those group of people and then focusing communication, but also training on that will really help re engage individuals in the way that they want to embrace it. And then ABC scorecards, um, I've mentioned before around working out at this stage, what what, what would successful adoption look like for you? One of the best ways to do that is measurements. And we, um, we have an ABC scorecard. Again, we've got the templates you're welcome to use um, free of charge on our website, a, a simple templates you can follow. They're essentially a, a set of questionnaires, um, a set, sorry, a set of questions. And they focus on questions to understand if this person who's answering the questions is willing, to change is understanding what the change is to them and they have the knowledge of the change. So what you tend to expect to see is smaller triangles at the start because you're interviewing people that haven't necessarily known anything about the project or know how to use the project or that change. And then after, once they've gone through a fantastic approach that you, that, that you or a journey that you're going to put them on, they should be more more willing, more aware, and also more competent on the system. So understanding that at the start and measuring it at the end gives you that real strong business case 
to present at the end to say we did do a successful adoption actually because x percentage of our people had a rapid growth of whatever the measurement might be for you um i mentioned uh i've, I've mentioned a few of the um the different ways to analyze people and the project here we have created our own tool it is um it's a beta test uh, sorry it's in beta and it's free for you to use so if you would like to use that within your organization what it is 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 a, it's a set of different questionnaires that you can input data to send it out to your stakeholders they answer the questions and it comes back and pulls the reports back for you to analyze what that looks like so for example the social network analysis is something that you can get feedback from very quickly um, and it's available through our website i'm sure elizabeth can send you the details at the end so let's just go through what we've learned about the build um, so the aim in the build part is to get the information you need to create your plans and engage your audience. You do that by surveys, questionnaires, interviews, looking at analytics on existing systems, doing that through workshops or focus groups and looking at your performance measures. And tools that you can use, um, we've, I've given you one today about the ABC scorecards. We've got the B Insights tool. You can use Microsoft Teams to do that. Obviously, you can use uh, conferencing systems, um, things like that. And what I would recommend or practical tips for you to take away today is get the project team involved as much as possible. This is not one person's job within a project. It's focusing on spreading these, these responsibilities to the right person in your team. Often that might be somebody different. Uh, based on who you have in your team. Um, I know some uh, BAs, for example, that actually are really great at writing communications. I know other people that um, within a team that actually really enjoy engaging with people. So lean on their strengths by understanding that that, that project team as a whole. Minimize the disruption by using familiar or easy to use tools. For example, I'm a Microsoft Teams house, using Zoom for me, obviously isn't as efficient for me as using Microsoft Teams. So if you're, so, so make sure you're leaning on the right, right systems that you can use in your company. Make sure your questions are concise and comprehensive. Um, one of my best tips and something I try to apply to everything I do um, is, can a 12 year old read and understand this? And if they can, based on no business knowledge, then it's, then it's simple enough, it's comprehensive enough. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't think that by putting big words or, um, or acronyms into any of your engagement or communication is a good thing. It's not. Real basic language is the best way for everyone to really obtain what, that, what you're trying to say. Engaging early is really crucial. Something that um, one of the big factors for um, my parachuted into failing projects is we're not engaging from from the outset you know we're we're a project team coming up with this idea we're speaking to maybe one or two people in the business who think they know what the business want but they don't often know what what the company needs so do engage early straight away get that guidance from everyone from your communications right through to your stakeholders Utilize that company resource where you can. It will save you so much time. For example, don't go out to, to, to a creative company to create uh, training videos for you when they don't even know what your brand, brand guidelines are. If you've got a marketing um, department, they'll know quicker. Utilize them. It will be quicker, cheaper for you in the long run. Always check previously. Obviously, we're, we're all great here uh, within project teams to look at lessons learned. Um, and closure summaries. What have your colleagues done? What's worked well for them? And really lean on that. You might find that they'll immediately be able to recommend um, people that they've found have been great champions or, bid, or really good advocates within their projects. Likeliness is you'll be able to, to, to um, uh, you lean, on, lean on that advice again and utilize them. Influencers, lean on influencers early, um, early enough. The, the, the biggest uh, tip here throughout my entire career is influential people will save you 
a lot a, a lot of um, time and, uh, and and pain and headache because they will really support and advocate that for you but also champions you know these are the people that are going to make this change happen and they excuse the expression are free of charge you know all you need all you need to do is motivate them in the right way work that out and they will be able to very much help you promote this and uh, and make this change happen Okay, so moving on, we've got the excite phase. The excite phase. Nicholas, sorry to interrupt, it's Elizabeth. I just wondered, because Matthew's put a question in which is specifically relevant oh, okay. to the previous phase. So before we moved on, maybe you'd want to pick up on that one. Lovely. Can, yes, you, can you see it on the screen? Because I can read it out if you can't. I've just seen it. Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, so yeah, great, great prompt, actually. I, I'll ask after everyone. So Matthew, um, how critical is an organization's history with a project or projects to determining whether they are receptive to engaging with the business change? Is this typically addressed prior to the build phase as part of pre-qualification? Will this heavily influence the approach and who you use to advocate or champion change? Um, so when it comes to an organization's history of project or projects to determine, I th my understanding of your question there, uh, Matthew, is maybe projects in the past haven't necessarily been um, uh, taken on very well or engaged with the business too well. Um, and therefore, would that be something that would change the way that you would or who you would use? So um, it's a loaded question. Um, I would say that um, there are scenarios. I, I think that you should always look at the history of previous projects to learn from them, but don't don't, don't make the assumption that a person who maybe was negative previously or not, ne not necessarily advocating good change will be the, the wrong person for this one or vice versa. So um, I mentioned um, about the change players, you, you have positive, neutral, negative, and, and if managed correctly, you can actually shift people's, people's opinions of something um based on, on on what that is so in a scenario where you've had a previous project and maybe some one two three whoever how, however many people have maybe been a little bit more negative towards that and not willing to change that might be a completely different reason for them this time so um for example, that, that, that their appetite for the change might be different. It might be that a previous project or program has, has really had a negative impact on them, or they've been in a negative place in their career. And therefore, this, this new change that you're introducing to them might actually be something that they're extremely positive about, uh, positive about, or vice versa. So what I would recommend you would do is you would tackle this on this very early on as part of your initiation, begin to understand that history to work out what um, what has gone on previously and maybe who may use may need to be a good influence or not. And then um, focus on focus on um a clean slates you know don't don't come in there with too much of a, a pre-assumption about somebody has that answered that question like i said it's quite a weighted weighted question so if it hasn't just feel free to clarify that for me okay matthew's put that in the chat thank you for that answer oh perfect yeah lovely thank you um okay so moving on then um excite um is about um creating and informing and marketing. I've got this um, caption here, rallying the troops. This is this is very much around the engagement now. And um, obviously every stage is very crucial, but this one is crucial for, for, for uh, engagement. We talk about communications, lots of people put some great, great responses to um, the, the element of a project being communications. Communications is um, one word for it. But what I don't want us to ever focus on is emails. Remember my fact, 2% of people will read an email. I, I personally, um, ha happy to share this, share this with you, I actually um, personally struggle to read things on a screen. 
So if somebody sends me a really long email, I'm re I really struggle to read that. And I'd rather just give them a call and speak, speak to them about something. There are a lot of people with different needs and different preferences. So if you are assuming that sending one email is going to get you, get you heard, you're wrong. This is around that uh, project campaign. Think about it as a sales pitch, a marketing pitch. And this can be as, uh, as big as you can create it, obviously based on times and budgets and, uh, and resources, or it could be something that just ignites it with the right people, those influencers. So it's very much how your project will, will run. You'll understand this in build phase already, but maybe you've got um, areas where you can pop up with some cakes in, in, in a lunch hall, or maybe you have a regular town hall or, or regular team presentations. This is one of the biggest um, biggest strengths for me, those stand-ups that, that teams have. Just ask to come along to one of them or ask even better, ask somebody from that team to present what's going on. So igniting those groups during the excite phase is really crucial. So let's look at some examples as to how we do this. Uh, sorry, let's look at how that looks um, in our project lifecycle again. Obviously, we had in the initiation and design, we had the build. We're going to start exciting people during the build phase. So when we are working on our project and we're beginning to build our product, this is where you're going to really start that excitement phase. You're going to create that marketing campaign. You're going to start informing and engaging the influencers and asking them to share and spread their um, it, it, it spread, sorry, spread the news, engaging the people, selling that change and preparing for the equip stage. So preparing how to train people. Obviously, part of this excitement that you're going to um, campaign is the knowledge that's going to come with it. Guys, guess what? We've got something new happening and it's going to happen next month. And we are going to give you an amazing um, training campaign on this. You know, part of that excitement is that education uh, piece that you're going to move into. So here are some examples of stuff that I've done in the past. Um, number one, creating a project visual identity. Tip here, got to be careful with the wording. Um, I've used the mistake previously where I've said project logos and sometimes companies, the culture of company don't like that. So I call it visual identity. This is around recognition. It, uh, any marketing person will tell you it takes five to seven impressions for somebody to abs absorb what you're trying to market them. So if you see, um, an, uh, I don't know, a new chocolate bar come out, and um, you will need to see that chocolate bar logo five to seven times for you to remember what it is. The same goes for a project. If you are Bob and you are talking about um, a, a new project that's happening that's, um, I don't know, round pegs, people aren't going to take that in for the first time. But if all of a sudden you are Bob and you are talking about this new project, great news, guys, we're going to fit a round peg into a square hole, or the other way around probably, impressions, 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 people will begin to remember that, okay? So um, examples here is digital workspace, it's such a buzzword these days, but creating a logo and then putting the different kinds of products that you're launching within that logo tend to help. This is an example where um, I was launching uh, Microsoft 365 and actually, I was introducing um, each product or each tool, sorry, shall I use the right, uh, the, 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 the politically correct words? Each tool was introduced every other month because we wanted to do, it, to, to do this slowly. And actually what happened after a while is you could ask people within this particular uh, organization and they would immediately know from these rings that it was digital workspace. And so they knew that this was the next tool that they were receiving and we got we we found that people were getting quite excited about attending our uh, live events attending our training reading our um, engagement materials etc the second part which um if you really want to stand out immediately something you can do right now if you've done nothing else before and you're currently through um, a live project is centralize your information this is one place for everyone 
And often, again, using resource, lean on your resource, talk to your IT group. You might find that you have an existing platform that you can use, for example, SharePoint online or training. Um, there's a lots of great learning uh, management systems out there, LMSs that you can use that will centralize this information. So then what your messaging comes to when you speak to your influencers, you can say to them, can you please mention every time you speak about our project that all of our information can be found here or it can be found by clicking on this URL link that will send them to a SharePoint site. Think about it as, um, as a website page. And then what happens is you start to get more and more traffic to this one area and people start to rely on you uh, and, and um, feel secure with the information that you're giving them. So they're more likely to look at it. Another thing is around clear transparency and e uh, ease of use messaging. I mentioned before, um, think about can a 12 year old understand this, even though they don't have uh, business knowledge. Think about simplifying it. Simple is always the best way. Culturally speaking, um, keep the language suitable as well. Um, I, I, I can fall into this trap often. I'm, I'm currently dealing with a, um, uh, a, um, a large organization at the moment. And I used a word the other day, due diligence. And I forgot that I'm speaking to people that are fantastically speaking their second language being English. Uh, what's the point of me using language when they're just going to sit there going, oh, I don't understand what she's saying. Uh, think roadshow campaigns. Um, where do your colleagues congregate? I mentioned um, uh, maybe, you, maybe you have a lunch hall. Obviously, we're a lot more remote these days, but often people will have areas, training um, invites, um, meetups that they have online maybe you've got a good yammer group that you can lean on who wherever that is just think about how you can road show that, road show that campaign and offer those demos to those people live events are a really good uh, option these days obviously elizabeth's done a fantastic job with tonight just using the social medias of LinkedIn and obviously her email campaigns and newsletters, she's been able to rally us all on together to meet. So again, just thinking outside the box, what do, what do your organization do to make people come together and lean on that? What's in it for me? Uh, one of my favorite buzzwords, no one is going to be willing to read or embrace the change unless you sell what it is that they need to do. So think about very selfishly, what is it, what, what is in it for me as an individual and make sure that you campaign it that way. Uh, I mentioned um, communications, engagement. Think about the management, give them the suitable materials for them to present to you. If they have a daily stand up, ask them just to present one slide for you. And it's going to be a lot more engaged because people are going to listen to it. Live demonstrations, mention those. These are really great opportunities to showcase what the project is and how you can use that. Okay, so Excite, sell your change to your colleagues impacted, that's your aim. How you do that, you do this from engaging and energetic marketing campaigns. And tools that you can use are everything from visual branding through to um, videos, roadshows, gamifying something, looking at team presentations, etc. Practical tips for myself, utilize those corporate events and lean on senior stakeholders. Look at brand identity across all of your materials. If you can put program or brand identity into that, Put it across everything. If you are presenting on a PowerPoint, use it. If you are providing training videos, use it. Think about existing tools. Maybe you do have a good internet site or a comms channel that you can use. Always ask marketing and IT and it, or, or even training at the stage because they, they will help you with the um, uh, centralization. Get commitment from early adopters for case studies. So um, speak to people that might be already showing some really positive um, uh, uh, communication to you or, or, or engagement to you and start thinking about maybe they could be good case studies for you to move into and make it fun. You know, if, you, if your organization lets you, be refreshing, be new. 
stand out amongst all of the other projects and be that person who's doing something different. And then always lean on those influencers. Uh, any questions before I move on to the next one? I'm not double check. No, okay. Uh, okay, so the last part of the methodology is the equip. This is providing the ability to learn. At this stage, I just want to advocate, um, I, just, I just want to add to this. This is not saying be a trainer. I think train, um, training is a specific role and it should always be taken up by a professional if your budget enables that. If you don't, this is about leaning on existing resource or um, documentation that you might have, but it's also about making interesting ways to help people be accountable for that own development. So it's around coaching and modern learning, and it's thinking outside that box. So when you're uh, when you're adding the equip stage, this is much very much. Um, in the go live section. So as you're getting ready for your go live, this is when you want to start equipping people with that. And the kind of things that you will do are champion training. So this is training up the champions to make sure they understand the system fully, but also where they can go to for additional support if they need it. It's populating those learning tools, whatever they might look like for your organization. Obviously it's educating those people, i.e. training them, however they need training. It's also at this stage reviewing the ABC scorecards. So this comes back to the, have we helped them? If that triangle hasn't got bigger at this stage, we haven't supported them enough and therefore we need to uh, think agile now, we need to go back and revisit exactly why they're not really understanding. And then bring that change to life through story. So what that, um, what that supports is, um, in the excite phase, you start to chat and engage people that might be good case studies. So often you'll hear people go, oh, Becky, this is the best thing that, uh, you know, this is amazing. I needed this ages ago. Ah, maybe you'll be a good case study for us. And then when you're in close, this is a really good time to release things. So release interviews, um, release blogs or news feeds or articles that you can do. And the reason you'd want to do that is because that recognizes those positive change players and it gives them that, thank you very much for being so positive. But it also, um, it helps with a, a human's behavior, which is a herd mentality. So somebody will always more likely feel the feel they're missing out on something if it's if it's shown to them so if their peers and colleagues are talking about this new fancy product and they're not quite using that new product they're going to want it they're going to want to be part of the gang as such and celebrate that success um, obviously always always um, celebrating the positivity making sure that you get the influencers to help celebrate and congratulate those really good um, good examples and case studies that have happened. And then finally, lessons learned. We mentioned before in build, what has happened, what's worked well previously in, uh, in other projects. By doing those lessons learned, naturally you can start to feed that information over to your other colleagues that may be working on a new project that they need that information from. So some examples here, um, one of them is training videos. So as I mentioned, we're not, we're not trainers, that is a, speci um, a speciality, but maybe you already have some uh, materials that you can use just by pointing people to um, open source information on the web will be better than not giving them anything. If you are going to do training videos, whoever's doing those, make sure that they are focusing on um, small and um, relevant information. I like to get a big um, one hour training video and break it down into little sections. Five minutes, how do we navigate? Five minutes, call and chat, how do we do that? Understanding change players. So how can we make sure that we can improve neutral and negative change players' behaviors? And how do we tackle that? We can create lots of different training materials that will help them. Um, encourage that positive praise. So this is um, obviously those interviews. So doing things like top tips, you can do this very much by recording a, a Teams call or a Zoom call, interviewing people what they liked about the product, putting that putting that out onto your open resource, um, asking them what their tips are, and and getting that feedback from them are all really good ways that you can help 
to create that positive praise. So practical tips then. Oh, 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 oh. The aim, um, the aim of the equip stage is to educate those change players on how to adapt the change and how to use the new systems, but also where to go to for support. You can do that in many ways, drop in training, quick start videos, reference guides, one to one training, virtual floor walking, some of these I'm sure you're recognizing already knowledge, um, knowledge tests, lead by examples, um, colleague case studies and good habits tools that you can use, everything from uh, live events, um, video making tools, if you need to, online meetings, demos, floor walking, engagement with the management and asking them to take that accountability on and looking at social tools. Um, you know, what do you have in your organization that can help spread and, uh, and educate? And also those communication channels. So practical tips, ensure the training is suited to the individual. So what are the behaviours that they need to do? We mentioned before about personas. What does that look like for them? Ensure that all training is linked to that learning management system. I'm really sorry about this. Um, so make sure that all of the information is in one area. Uh, cover all styles of learning so that you are engaging everybody. I mentioned before, I don't necessarily like to look at things on a screen, but I love somebody to, to, to show me personally. Promote the champions. Make sure that people know what, where, where the champions are and how they can support them. And then just ensure that you can promote that good success through the influencers. Make sure those influencers are helping promote that. And obviously my presentation is dying to finish. So I'm really sorry about the, uh, the, the play function there, but that's, um, that's everything that I, I've got within the hour to talk to you today. Um, I've got a few minutes. So I'm happy to stay on for longer if anyone wants to. Uh, I guess we can go over to um, questions. Are there any that anyone has for me? I think we've been answering them as we've been Great. going along. But one question that did come up a couple of times was, is it possible to share the slides? Yes, by all means, yeah, I'll share them through you, if that's okay. okay. And someone asked whether they can share the webinar overall. Yes, it's being recorded and I will put together a um, an email out to everyone who registered with a link to Nicholas slides and also the, the link to the recording. So if you want to watch it back or share it with your colleagues, we'll put it onto YouTube as well and you'll be able to share those links. Yeah, perfect. Chris and has asked the, about the templates. Yeah, and um, so just saw that, Chris. Yes, um, so on my uh, company website, simplifychange.co.uk, uh, we have a whole section of resource, and so that's just open source that you can use. And if you do want to use the insights tool, like I said, it's in beta testing and it's free of charge to use, you just need to register, and then we can walk you through how to use that. Um, caveat is lots of feedback will be great. Um, the other thing as well is obviously um, can't do it without promotion. Um, feel free to, I think I'm a bit blurred, but um, we can send a link out as well for the book. So everything I've gone through today rapidly within one hour is all in here as well. So I go into more detail about that. Um, so feel free to, to grab the book as well, which has the QR codes to the templates. The link is uh, simplifychange.co.uk, isn't it? I, I, at the moment, all I've got the ability to do is to chat to host and panelists, so I can't type it in for, yeah. <laughs> in for you, Christina, but um, yeah, I will are. share that. Uh, there was another question that I think, oh yes, uh, B. Sinclair asked, where do the email stats come from? You mentioned that, it, that only 2% of your messages get read. Yeah, they, they are. Um, so they are all referenced in my book as well. But that ProSci, um, so ProSci do a yearly um, uh, assessment of all of these. So they come from ProSci. Perfect. And there is one more question that's just popped up in the Q&A panel about aligning against the project life cycle. Can you uh, see that one? Yeah. How have you aligned this against project life cycle? However, this says more around building the comms change comp if we launch otherwise less okay design opportunities i think what they might be getting at there is the, yeah. the overlay of the project life cycle i mean for, for me as i interpreted it we put a lot of the effort into the build phase at the beginning which is around 
prior to go live and is around project initiation and kickoff and getting that change mandate then yeah. during the excite phase you're in delivery phases of your project and you are bringing people along on the journey and then at the equip phase that is the part of the project life cycle where actually we're doing the delivery and the go live so yeah. yes yeah. there are points where you're building the comms change campaign pre-launch prior to go live but then there is also other points in the project where we are co-designing and we're co-creating content with people who are actually doing the doing and then who are living with the outcome of of the change yes absolutely and this was one this was one example um obviously this this was more trying to show you the structure of what where roughly that you do um each stage but obviously it will always be based on the kind of project that you're working on as well you know it might be that you are moving into more of an agile way and therefore there'll be reiterate uh, there'll be iterations of different parts of this and don't forget this will always this will always be circular and always, you'll always have to come back and reevaluate things or refine things as and as when you go along so it's it, it it's Today's presentation is an example, but obviously it will always have to be managed by what your project looks like as a whole. Well, what I really liked about the book is actually you don't have to do the whole thing. If you yeah. just want to do social network analysis, you can do that. If you just want to do the ABC radar diagram, that, that really impresses people <laughs> in my experience. <laughs> you can just pull that one out. So you can use the different tools and templates and techniques however you want in a very flexible way because you haven't exactly I mean yes you've given us the structure but as project professionals we can adapt that to the projects yeah. that we work on exactly I I'm you know I've I've said this several times and I'll say it again this is not rocket science um what I talk about in the book is not rocket science it's just it's just enabling people to have that awareness of things that they can do tools and tricks that they can use throughout your project so it's very much structuring it structuring it enough so that you can understand it in a life cycle but like you said Elizabeth it's very much uh, it, you you adapt this based on on your expertise and your knowledge within projects just being mindful around the people mm. brilliant okay i think looking down my list uh that was all the questions christina's question might be relevant to more of you so i'll just recap that one if you didn't see it pop up in the q a panel that was around can we get pd pdus for attending this webinar and yes you can i'm not a pmi authorized training provider so you'll have to type it in manually it will be self-directed learning um, but if you just go into your learning log or your pdu log you can say you spent an hour with us today you can jot down a few of your key learning points um and yes you you'll be able to to claim for that i'd probably do it under technical skills it's not called that anymore it's called power skills isn't it change management would be um a, a power skill in my book yeah too right uh, Chris says, can you talk a bit more about the Insight app? Do you want to share your screen and actually show it to us? Uh, yeah, they probably put me under the pressure. Of Sorry. The <laughs> uh, let me just get it up. Um, I know we've run slightly over, so if people do have a hard stop at the top of the hour, they've probably dropped off. But if you do have other meetings and things you need to, to get to, we, like I say, I'll send out the recording so you'll be able to catch up on uh, this this last bit if you need to drop off the call now okay sorry i'm just going to quickly log in it's very generous of you to make these tools available for free so i had a look at them and you think um you know you, there's obviously a lot of thought and effort that's gone into putting those tools together yeah um uh, it's I mean the the insights tool was very much a uh, um, the, the concept of it it was to provide uh, feedback um, so that we can prove the tool um, which is obviously ongoing mm -hmm. the um, and for some reason I can't log into it which is not great okay well um, what might be a better solution then Chris because I can see you've put in another specific question about the insight app is if I pass your details on to Nicola um, maybe someone in your team Nicola could Yes, by all means. I mean, I'll just quickly show you roughly what it looks like here. So um, this is usually I can log in, but for some reason my credentials aren't working. Um, so essentially what you have here is you have all of these different assessments that you can choose to do. So for example, it might be that you want to do a communication assessment, which is understanding how your colleagues want to be communicated to or a training assessment. What does that look like? What kind of training do your individuals need? And then by clicking on it, probably won't work because I'm not signed in. 
Um, yeah, for some reason, I don't know why it's not logging into it. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, but <laughs> when you click on one of these, it basically um, gives you a rundown of or, or a summary of how long it will take. And then it goes through some questions and they are literally based on one to five or uh, five stars, depending on the on the assessment. And then once you collect all of those um, as a as a um, admin of this uh, for your organization, you'll then pull the reports back and the reports will show you what people's answers are. Um, I, I, I often say it's a um, it's a, it's, a, it's the change management version of SurveyMonkey, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the way it works. But yeah, if you'd like some more information, then I will put you in contact. Um, sorry, what did you say? It was Chris that. Yeah, Chris. Chris. Walken. I'll, I can dig out his email address and pass that on. And then. Um, yeah. And then, um, yeah. So, Chris, if you want to. Together. We, can, we can contact and put you in, put, put you into the system and you can use it. That is probably a good point for us to ask you to tell us how else we can get in touch with you so for, for continuing the conversation is linkedin the best place do you want people to come to to the website where i know they can get a copy of the book yes 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 um so all of those ways um obviously um on linkedin i'm nicola graham uh, and Elizabeth and I are connected anyway, so hopefully you've already seen this on there. Um, you're welcome to email me. I'm Nicola at Simplify Change. I'll put that into the notes as well. Um, and then, as as we've mentioned, feel free to contact me via the website uh, simplifychange.uk. But I'm, uh, you know, I'm really, really um, uh, happy to hear from people. Um, any, you know, any questions, feedback. Um, anything just please reach out you know it's uh, it's always really great to, to connect with people and hear about your particular projects and you know if there's any any ideas we can swap and share that's always good as well brilliant okay well i think that's probably a good point for us to chris says can i ask one ask one what a question <laughs> still going with the questions chris <laughs> yes <laughs> Is that all right for you, Nicola? Have you got time yeah, to stay on? No, 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 I'm, okay. I always manage to overrun on uh, all my presentations. But... <laughs> you might need to put a few more words than process mapping tools or come off mute. Process mapping tools that can drill down. Okay, so sorry, what is the question? Process mapping tools that can drill down. As the host, Nicola, you might be able to make a Oh, I always say Chris not a attendee anymore so that he can actually ask ask the question in real life. <laughs> no idea how to do that, I'm afraid. Uh, Chris, let's have a look here. I will send out Nicola's links um, in the email that's going to come out tomorrow or the next day um, with the recording and everything. So well, don't worry, you will get access to those. So as I was previously demonstrating, always keep to the tools you know. Unfortunately, I don't know. You are allowed to talk. There you go. I don't know. Uh, hi, Chris. Right. I think you should be able to talk okay. to us. Yes, fantastic. Hey. So, thanks very much for your time. I, I was just um, wondering if you knew of a tool that was better than something like Visio, which allows you to do process mapping like DFD diagrams and allow you to drill down to the next level and yes well um uh so personally um i've actually just recently discovered muro like in real detail and i absolutely love it okay What's and m-i-r-o i don't even know if i say it right myro muro okay. um, it's it's a whiteboarding facility but it has so many templates on there it's incredible um and it's um it has this ability and by the way i've got no affiliation to this at all except the fact i love the tool um you can also it's really great for presenting and and um doing a lot of um workshops uh on and things like that and focus groups because you can um you can have questions put in there you've got all of these different tools at the top it's really really good so personally i mean i'm i'm literally after this call, I'm going straight back to Muro to carry on with my process mapping that I'm that I'm doing around personas. So that's what I recommend. De Deborah's put something. Um, I graphics G R A A F X. Never, I've never used it or heard of it. But um, yeah, again, it's 
I'm assuming it might be a good one. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, you know, I, I get really well with it so far and I'm still learning. So, oh, there you go, Kate. We use Muro too and it's lovely. Night, yeah, it is, Kate. It's a lovely way to present to clients. And I've, I'm actually shifting from PowerPoint now and using Muro. I, I want to present on that as well. It's really good. Really good. No. And it's free, right? <laughs> uh double check i don't know i'm using it in organ i'm using it in an organization so i don't think it is i think you can have a free account because i've got a free account but uh, it limits how other people can interact with your boards or something like that so it might be that people can view but they can't contribute and as it's also does whiteboarding and collaboration yeah. type type things um yeah, because the company ones, they integrate with the groups as well, don't they? So you can see. So again, you know, kind of thinking about the how do we engage and how do we um, centralise information? Miro seems to have that in it as well. Did you get any pushback at all from using the corporate sites? Because, you know, they tend to have a corporate suite of applications. And if you go outside of that, then, you know, it seems to be frowned upon. I don't know how you guys yes. got around that. Yeah, I mean, it varies organisation per organisation. And I've, I find some organisations extremely restrictive in what they use. And so, for example, if we use the Muro example, I can't stand whiteboard in Teams, but sometimes I'm forced to use it. Um, you know, obviously Microsoft do wonderful things, but they don't do whiteboarding. I tried to do that the other day, use a whiteboard, and I was like, no, Google Jamboard is easier. Oh, <laughs> I've never, back. I would I would happily write on paper and just show a screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. honestly I, I mean yeah so so in in short when i talk about the uh, build stage and understanding your organization that is one of the things you want to understand what can we use what tools are out there that we can use and can we even plug into them the yeah. insights tool for example you might find your organization say no you can't use it there's nothing confidential on that on there it's all um you know we've designed it in a way that it's um anonymous so it doesn't hold any sensitive information but some companies may not they may restrict restrict it so you have to put the url into your safe um into your safe uh safe websites part yeah the pdfs that you had associated with it um are those uh, are the pdfs the the actual questions themselves that goes into the insight tool um so p so the insights tool creates questionnaires and then put, runs out reports. The PDFs that you'll find on the website are, um, I've taken the questionnaires and put them into PDFs for you to use. Perfect. So that's more of a, uh, you know, so, so essentially what that is, is that showing you what questions to use and then you'll just need to collect the information. So if you've got really good BA, <laughs> pass it on to them and I'm sure they'll create their own version of it. Again, right. it, it, it's, it's, if you've got a good BA, chance are you, you know, they'll, they'll be able to do most of this modeling for you anyway. So I'm, I'm sure they'll be happy with that work that I'm going to give them. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> delegate, delegate, delegate. Indeed, yeah. Role and <laughs> responsibilities, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it always varies on the BA. Some, some BAs love the, the, the business change elements or the change analytical parts of it. Others don't. They prefer to do the technical side. So, you know, like, choose, choose wisely. Kirsty says, I find the tools my younger stakeholders are interested in engaging are very different than those used by older stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely, Kirsty, I find the same. But again, that's understanding your people at the start. One and, of the, um, sorry. You know, we're, we're, we're working across five generations now in organizations. So um, the expectations are different. And funny enough, um, I'm trying to remember where I saw this report and I really should capture it again and put it out. But um, across the five generations, it's something like the youngest generation and the second to eldest generation actually have very similar preferences. So for example, they, um, they prefer to meet in, in person more than the other three. It's, it was really interesting uh, statistics. You, you assume, that, that sorry to say it but the older that you are the less tech tech friendly you are but actually it's not always that case mm. but that's just knowing your people knowing what tools are going to resonate with them using different techniques for different people to get the right result yeah and if you if you work for example in a government organization the chances are you'll have more of a 
stereotype of generations and what they prefer. But if you're working in a um, creative media company, you know, your, your cool kids are, you know, throughout all of the generations, right? So it, it depends on depends on the culture for sure. Mm. Great. Chris, sorry, you're gonna ask another question or? I, I was, but I wasn't sure if it was relevant. It was to do with um, roles and responsibilities. I just noticed on your framework, you didn't sort of include it in any way. Um, yep. so I just wondered if you you kind of um, sort of look to deal with that at a detail level when you have your individual project meetings or kickoff or something like that. I didn't. Yeah, I mean, I I would I would leave that as a whole in a project. The roles right. and responsibilities is a is obviously a racy that that needs to happen in the project. What I would say is. Uh, roles and responsibilities for a champion and an influencer is something that you should um, educate them on. So, uh, but but that's something that will evolve. For example, if you start speaking to stakeholders and they say, "Sorry, you want me to be an influencer? What's an influencer?" That's always the next question. So at that point, you'll want to um, define what that looks like for them. Right. Um, so it's it's then going well. Actually, as an influencer, what we are asking or asking from you is x amount of time x amount of commitment you know and obviously try and keep it lightweight so that, so that they're not that they're not frightened of the idea so they say yes <laughs> yeah 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 got it thank yeah. you no worries brilliant um, i think that's everything I think it is. Well, thank you so much for giving up your evening and coming to talk to us about change management, sharing your methodology with us. It's been really helpful. And I think you can see from the comments in the chat how much people have got from the session. Um, and I'm sure people will be falling over themselves to go through the slides again because they were so rich with so much information in there. Um, that would be really useful. So I will coordinate with you and we'll get those out to people. Perfect. So that's that it really everybody we're bringing our session to a close and uh thanks very much for for coming along and making the time for this session thanks again to you nicola and for everybody else have a fantastic evening and the rest of the day <laughs> happy evening everyone